Greetings, fellow humans, and welcome to the book Wormhole. Needless to say, this video is extremely late. This year has been so chaotic for me, and it's going to continue to be so for a while. So just bear with me. I didn't want to skip March though, because I did a lot of good reading during this month, and possibly read one of my top books of the year. So this is just here to say that. I'm still here, you haven't gotten rid of me yet, and my April wrap-up is probably going to be belated as well. Let's get into March, though. The first book I read was Meet Me in Another Life by Catriona Silvi. Thora and Santi are both foreigners when they meet for the first time in Cologne. Shortly after, Santi dies in an accident, but what young Thora doesn't realize at the time is that she will be meeting him again in her next life, and the life after that, and again, and again. This was a really unique read, format-wise, where each chapter is its own separate universe slash timeline, though following the same characters and taking place in the same city. It was hard not to get attached to certain timelines, but the promise of a new one in the next chapter held my interest throughout, and I think I read this book in like two to three days because of that. Considering that the setting is very limited, solely taking place in the city of Cologne, with only a few notable locations within, it came across as a fully realized setting. I can't speak for accuracy, but the city felt real, like its own character that I got to know intimately throughout the duration of the story. I like that this book explores love in all different forms, as the connection Thor and Santi have in each iteration alters, particularly dependent on their ages. However, I wish there wasn't a romantic version included, especially since in the timeline where they are lovers is smack dab between the one where Santi is her teacher and the one where he's her dad, and in both of these universes, Santi is a middle-aged adult, whereas Thora is an elementary-aged child. It was kind of just weird given its placement, but also somewhat unnecessary. I think even without Santi and Thora having a romance, their love for each other still comes through clearly, and I think the book would have had a greater statement if it never ventured into the romance category, since storytelling is so saturated with romantic love already, and therefore it's easy to equate romance with love. Whereas with an iteration where Thor is Santi's caretaker, a stranger paid to look after a declining in health Santi, it finds the love in more mundane connections we have with other people. I don't think it would have made the multiple lives of Thor and Santi any less beautifully woven together and meaningful if they were never romantically attracted to each other. I kind of guessed the main reveal of the book, but only because I've written something very similar in a short story, but of course this book took a very different take on the idea. There's not much in the way of sci-fi elements until the very near end of the book, but this is a very thoughtful existential read focusing on the relations we have with other people. And this was definitely a five stars for me. Far From the Light of Heaven by Tade Thompson. When first mate Michelle Campion departs from Earth on the Ragtime's maiden voyage, the job seems too easy to be true. However, upon waking from stasis, Campion discovers 30% of her passengers have been killed, and she is now trapped aboard with an unknown killer and the ship's AI offline. Enter investigator Rashid Finn, tasked with uncovering the murderer, though he isn't entirely sure Campion isn't the culprit he's looking for. One of the things that impressed me about this book was how much world building it achieved in such a small amount of time. Notable places in the book feel fully realized, which is particularly particularly impressive when the majority of the action takes place on a ship locked in orbit. This is an African futurism novel, so not only is the main cast entirely black, but it also explores the concept of black people colonizing their own solar system as a way of creating a black utopia, and sort of the pushback against that from white people. It felt believable because I can see this happening as a response to the real oppression of black people we still see today, and how that will shape the future. 
as well as just seeing how critical society is of Black people, even when they are doing incredible things. That was definitely my favorite aspect of this book, and I'd love to see more written in this creative universe, though I'm not sure Thompson has anything else planned for it. Once the murderer is revealed, though, the book starts to get a bit flimsy for me. The reveal was essentially like, and the murderer is this guy, and it's some dude that has literally never been mentioned before. Then the book hops perspective to his past and uncovers his motives, which I kind of wish the book kept a suspense of who is this guy and why is he doing these things, rather than instantly reveal everything. The narrative abandons the characters we've been following up until this point, and from that point on, the book no longer feels like it's about these characters, but rather about the murderer, especially considering that while we as readers understand who this guy is and what his motives are, these are answers that are never revealed to any of the main characters. The main characters exist mostly to bear witness to this plot with not actually doing anything about it besides trying to survive. It makes me wonder if the entire book should have followed the murderer's perspective instead. I also wish there was more hint towards the murderer and his motive before the reveal. Maybe we didn't need to meet him before, but something as simple as like maybe introducing the conflict which caused him to act with violence, like maybe before boarding the ship, Campion notices protesters or something to foreshadow that there is tension in this world. Or maybe even the more important bit of technology that plays a crucial role in this is mentioned to exist before this moment because it did kind of feel like it came out of left field. I really enjoyed the aliens in this book. They're kind of this thing that most people in the universe don't know about and are conceptually quite nebulous. Even humans who work with or have close relationships with aliens don't entirely understand what they are or how they function, and so I liked being able to experience that as a reader along with the characters. However, once they're explained, I felt like I understood them even less than before, and I wish it was just something that was left to be vague. I didn't like the romance in this book because it felt very instant love, especially since I'm gonna say the alien character's name wrong because I couldn't for the life of me find a pronunciation online. I'm gonna guess it's Yoke, especially since Yoke flirts with Campion first and doesn't show any interest in Finn's character until the moment they hook up, so I kind of assumed her character is someone who is just promiscuous. The relationship comes off more as a fling or a heat of a moment thing during a stressful time rather than love. Yet weirdly enough, as the story moves forward, the two act like a really close couple. This book had such a strong start. The things I liked about it, I really liked. But by the end, it sort of fell apart for me. I love the characters in this book, yet the story doesn't justify why these are the main characters, and a lot of the connections between them feel forced. I really wanted this book to blow me away, but unfortunately it didn't do so. I do think it's worthy of a 4 star rating though, and that's just because the world building, like I said, was just so tight. The Unraveling by Benjamin Rosenbaum as Fifth reaches the age of puberty and begins feeling the pressures society puts on them for being born a staid and not always fit in their gender role, life for Fifth begins to change. Their close friendship with their veil friend Shreya creates tension when Fifth realizes their forbidden feelings towards Shreya, and Fifth's failure to adhere to the expectations of being a staid threatens to dissolve their family cohort. I did film a reading vlog of this book, which I will hopefully be uploading sometime this month. I just need to edit it. What I love about this book is how incredibly alien the setting is. Considering that the characters are still human, but humans set so far into the future that society appears entirely unrecognizable to what it looks like now. I think Rosenbaum did a brilliant job with that. I love the new genders. Rosenbaum created and how both Staid and Vale have both what we would recognize as stereotypically feminine or masculine traits. Like, it's impossible to read this and think that Staid is supposed to mean male and vice versa because it's its own thing. 
For example, states are the leaders of society, much like we would consider males to be, but are emotional and expected to refrain from sex like females. Alternatively, veils are seen as lesser, kind of like how we view females, and are expected to express their emotions solely through things like fighting and sex like males are expected to. I think the book does this really great job at showing how trivial these gender expectations are. It captures that awkwardness of puberty where suddenly you have these roles thrown upon you, but at the same time realizes that what society expects of you isn't exactly what you are. I also like that Stade and Vale are not associated at all with what one genitals looks like. In this future, people can make their bodies look however they want, and many characters have a mix of second sex characteristics, as well as unusual skin and hair colors or horns or literally whatever they want to look like. The way gender is determined after birth is super trivial. Depending on how a baby reacts to certain stimuli, they will be labeled as either staid or veil. And I like how trivial that gender assignment is because, again, I think it's one of the ways Rosenbaum is critiquing the concept of gender. One of the details of this book that gets kind of lost in all the world building is the concept of everyone having multiple bodies and the mind coexisting in all of them at once. The only thing this really contributes to the story is the way the story is told, as main character Fifth is able to be in multiple places at once. So therefore, usually two or three different stories are taking place, interchanging every few paragraphs. It's easy enough to follow, though sometimes feels like an unnecessary detail, despite how cool of a concept is. Especially since oftentimes one of Fifth's three bodies is usually just sleeping or studying while the others are on an adventure. It kind of feels like Rosenbaum didn't know what to do with the body, so he's kind of like, okay, they're sleeping. <laughs> Most of the conflict is with Fifth's growing attraction to their friend Shreya. I loved how for them being like technically opposite genders that their relationship still felt inherently queer as it was something that was taboo, and taboo only because of their genders. I thought it was a really neat way of critiquing our society's homophobia when love is just love. I also love the family element in this book. Fifth is an only child with several parents, as is standard in this world. Initially, I was a bit overwhelmed by the amount of characters introduced, but by the end of the book, I had a strong sense of who each parent was and what their relationship was like with Fifth. I liked all of the complexities of child-parent relationships the book explores, as well as the relationships between each of the parents and the conflicts that arise when trying to do your best to raise a child. This was a strong five stars, and this was honestly my favorite book of the month. Do You Dream of Terror 2 by Temi O. Oh. A crew of six teens have been chosen after years of training to embark on a 23-year-long journey to an Earth-like planet named Terra 2 in hopes of settling a second Earth for humanity to escape from their dying planet to. With only each other and a few veteran astronauts to depend upon, the crew will have to overcome the hostile environments of space and unfriendly odds in order to reach their destination. I buddy read this with Annie from Annie's Book Nook. I have so much to say about this book that I'm going to limit my comments in this video, so look out for our live show discussion if you're interested in hearing more about this book. This book felt ripe with potential. I loved how loyal to science it was, and many of the challenges faced in the book are reasonable things to overcome when dealing with space travel. With one exception though, and this is just a pet peeve coming from someone who lives in an area that has extreme winters, when facing the risk of freezing to death, it absolutely annoyed me to no ends that the crew remained scattered across the ship for no apparent reason when it would make more sense for them to condense into one room and huddle for warmth that's just standard dealing with cold rules. Besides that, I thought the book was very believable. I did find it a bit distracting that it was slightly alternate history in the fact that the book takes place in 2012. I honestly couldn't figure out why author O decided to set it in 2012 because even pop culture references were 
dating for 2012 as well. But the history of space travel O created for this world and the different research outposts and other attempts at generation ships I thought made the world both vibrant and believable. Characters felt overall like fully realized creations and acted in very human ways. However, the cast did feel a bit oversaturated at times and like certain characters were neglected in favor of others. There were definitely some character motivations that came out of seemingly nowhere because so little time was given to the character. As well as I think there was a lot of unexplored potential with many of the characters. I have mixed feelings on the way this book handles mental health. On one hand, I think it's very reasonable for these kids to be depressed while in space, especially after they worked nonstop since they were 14 to get on this mission. It reminds me of the post-college slump me and many of my friends went through. But at the isolation of space and nothing to do for the next 23 years as the ship flies its course, it's no wonder that they're getting the blues. However, it's kind of dropped as soon as this plot device gets inconvenient. In fact, a lot in this book felt handled in a similar way of plot points existing without later consequences and being dropped on a whim. I think I originally put this book on my TBR because it had asexual representation, but the asexual representation didn't feel well done in my opinion. Well, the term asexual is never used, it's pretty clear that the main character Juno has no interest in sex and even appears to be disgusted by sex. By the end of the book, she does end up consenting to losing her virginity, and while it's true that asexual people can have sex and want to have sex, her reasoning behind this choice remains unclear in a way that suggests that she just meant the right guy. I think her relationship with Jesse could have been equally as meaningful without her ever having to engage in sex with him. There's a lot of plot points that are never resolved, and few of the characters experience growth throughout the story. The ending was also just weirdly religious in a way that doesn't match the overall tone of the book. It felt extremely random and left me annoyed. I think there was a lot of good potential in this book, but the execution was too meandering and unfocused, and again, failed to hang on to plots and wrap them up in a meaningful way. So this is going to be a three stars for me. I'm definitely glad I read it, but I was ultimately not too impressed by it. And the last book I read this month was Carmilla by J. Sheridan Leigh Fanu. Laura lives a life of isolation with only her father for company, until one night a carriage crashes outside of their castle and they welcome the passenger into their home. Carmilla is sickly with strange habits, but Laura takes to her immediately, though the closer Laura gets to Carmilla, the weaker she gets. This was my classic read of this month. For those of you who aren't familiar, Carmilla is the original vampire novel and predates Dracula by almost 20 years. I really enjoyed this concept of vampirism as a metaphor for lesbianism or even just female sexuality and how you either suppress these parts of you or become a social outcast, much like Carmilla is. And this is further implied through the fact that had Carmilla not been stopped, Laura wouldn't have died, but she would have rise from the grave as a vampire herself. Laura appears to be ignorant of the danger she is in the entire time, and it is the men around her who vilify Carmilla and act to protect Laura, which again makes me think that this is a metaphor for society's treatment of women who take charge of their sexuality. Despite being told in first person, I found the story lacking in Laura's opinion or feelings on any of the things happening. The only thing I know for sure is that she does take to Carmilla quickly and has an extreme fondness for her, such as when she wanted to put a portrait she found that looks identical to Carmilla in her bedroom. But once the cause of Laura's sudden weakening gets attributed to Carmilla, I was surprised that there wasn't any response from Laura on how she feels about this. Would she feel used? Does she actually understand more about what's going on than she acts like? And actually consents to her blood being drank? And when the men in the book campaigned to stake Carmilla to death, I was almost expecting Laura to try to protect Carmilla, that or enthusiastically participate out of anger. 
Not much actually happens in this monk, which I think leaves a lot to interpretation. In fact, I could almost argue that Laura knew exactly what was going on, but consented to it. Overall, I had a hard time deciding what to rate this book. It's something that I am glad I did end up reading, but wasn't too impressed with the actual story. However, I can appreciate what this book did and for the time it came out. And it's no wonder it's a sapphic cult classic today, because there's no denying that there was love and romance between Laura and Carmilla, even if there was a lot left unexplored. So I'm gonna settle for three stars on this book. Okay, so that was my month, a whole month late. For April, I have a buddy read of Late from Uncommon Stars with Joan from The Rabbit Hole, and we will be doing a discussion of it. And that's all I have to say for now. You know the drill, support your local library, and shop independent bookstores when you can, and I'll see you next time.